with Russia constantly threatening the peace and security of European democracies. Many forget that there is another superpower with imperialist ambitions. For years, China was seen as a little more than a place for Western companies to cheaply manufacture their products. Now, its perception as a hostile totalitarian actor is growing. So, what should Europe do with China? Good evening, my name is Mateusz Mazzini and this is Why The View. China seems to be the elephant in the room of European politics. While more and more politicians are critical of Beijing's position on the international stage, many are still reluctant to openly call it a threat to the liberal democratic order. Even with mounting evidence of foul play, accusations of espionage and unfair trade practices, Brussels has no coherent strategy towards the government of Xi Jinping. The truth is, however, that Europe cannot afford to break ties with China completely. With Beijing's dominance in many areas of the economy, especially green energy and tech manufacturing, reliance on Chinese production is approaching new, record-breaking levels. We will discuss possible scenarios for the future of EU-China relations with tonight's guest, in just a moment. But first, let's see how big the Chinese presence in Europe actually is. The green energy transition is among the most important strategic objectives of the European Union. But without Chinese inputs, that ambitious plan is unlikely to succeed. Beijing is currently responsible for manufacturing as much as 80% of the global supply of solar panels. It also delivers approximately two-thirds of electric vehicles, wind turbines and lithium batteries to international markets. None of this happened by coincidence. Under the leadership of Xi Jinping, the Chinese economy abandoned the principle of the old triad, prioritizing appliances, furniture and clothing. It was replaced by the new three – solar cells, electric cars and lithium-based power units. In response to China's growing dominance, the European Commission proposed in 2023 a policy of de-risking Europe's relations with Beijing. This more consensual approach is intended to avoid direct confrontation with Xi Jinping. But European leaders find it hard to trust Chinese partners. Fears of intellectual property violations and supply chain issues are among their main concerns, and their fears are reflected in the data. Overall, Chinese direct investment in Europe is at its lowest level in 12 years. But that's not to say that Chinese projects have disappeared completely. Beijing is still pushing for ambitious projects, especially in infrastructure. Eastern and Southern Europe was invited into China's world-famous Belt and Road Initiative all the way back in 2014. Companies are particularly active in the Western Balkans, where they've broken ground on 132 construction projects, worth a total 32 billion euros. Many are facing growing scrutiny over their legality and their environmental impact. But with local economies stagnating and the push to achieve a net-zero economy, taking China out of the European equation appears impossible. So, what should Europe do with China? It seems to be very hard to find a coherent answer to that question. But tonight, we will try to do just that with the help of a fantastic panel of three expert guests. Joining us tonight are Dr. Igor Merheimer, advisor at the European Parliament, Elizabeth Bra, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and Matej Simalczyk, executive director of the Central European Institute for Asian Studies. Igor, as the representative of Brussels in our discussion, uh, I want uh, you to set the tone for uh, this analysis and answer a rather, I think, frank question. Who is China to Europe right now? Is it a friend? Is it a competitor? Is it a security threat? Or is it all of the above at once? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me and congratulations on the new show. 
and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you and also the also with Maciej and Elizabeth. Um, maybe let me start by setting the scene. I I think we need to go back maybe the last in the last four to five years to to help to understand uh, to answer this question, um, because the way the EU I think has put, understands um, China I think has certainly shifted. Uh, you said correctly that there is this uh, perception of China both as a competitor, as a partner, and as a threat. And certainly, the way the, the way the weighting of uh, whether it's more of a threat or a partner or a competitor is certainly changing. And I would say that certainly in the la in the past 24 uh, months, uh, we see certainly growing uh, trend towards more acknowledgement that China is increasingly more a competitor and a threat. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. Certainly one, we have seen how we became uh, dependent on China as a result uh, of COVID, which in itself uh, was a product, I think, of the totalitarian regime uh, governing China. Uh, so we saw these huge dependencies and the catastrophic effects it can have, including on people's lives and on our economies. We have seen uh, what is happening in Hong Kong in terms of destruction of uh, freedoms and uh, of the of, in the city? We have also seen uh, the Russian tacit support for um, uh, sorry Chinese support for Russia's war of ag aggression in Ukraine, but also increasing uh, attempts at economic coercion and other forms of. Uh, uh, threats against the EU member states. So there is, there is a growing acknowledgement that certainly China is not the partner we we thought it was uh, back in the 90s or early 2000s. And there is more emphasis on uh, on the competitor and the threat. But mm -hmm. in, in, in a union of 27 member states, that's not always um, a, 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 an easy picture to say. And there are certainly nuances in this. Very important to have this Europe-wide perspective, uh, as you've mentioned, Igor. But now I want to focus our discussion on a more uh, local case study. And for that, I want to bring Mate into this discussion. If you could comment on the Central European perspective on uh, Chinese partnership, how important a partner, especially economically, uh, is China for this part of the world? And why uh, are Chinese companies and Chinese government, broadly speaking, particularly focused on infrastructure investments in, namely, Western Balkans? So this question has, of course, uh, multiple layers to it. And uh, to answer it properly, we also need to distinguish between, as you alluded to, Western Balkans and the rest of the sea region, of which is uh, mostly part of the EU. And uh, these two groupings of countries come from a very different uh, points of departure when it comes to approaching China, even though at some point China tried to group them together under the umbrella of the China Sea Cooperation Platform, uh, nowadays known as uh, 14 uh, plus 1. Um, this kind of interest of CE into um, China, cooperation with China on uh, economic projects started largely as a result of the global financial crisis, where they found themselves cash strapped and they were looking at China as a potential alternative uh, resource for their investment and trade needs. However, most of their desires uh, re remained um, unfulfilled. Of course, we have a uh, several countries in the region that uh, might have benefited much more than the rest of them, uh, namely... Such Hungary, as? If you could Hungary, give some examples. Yes, such as Hungary and Serbia, those are the kind of the, the, the natural kind of culprits here that have benefited much more than the rest. Others have found themselves not to be benefiting from this cooperation uh, so much. Uh, illustratively, we can uh, point to the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. All of them have uh, since left this uh, grouping of uh, countries that were cooperating with China. Uh, Czech Republic, of course, also uh, very critical to various uh, Chinese projects and attempts to influence and uh, interfere in a domestic politics. And of course, we have a lot of countries in between that are also oscillating in their positions, also depending on what is the domestic political makeup, because various uh, parts of the political spectrums in individual countries have very different uh, positions on China. 
Slovakia, where I'm based, would be an illustrative case of that, as uh, over the past uh, three years, since 2020 until uh, almost end of 2023, we had a largely very critical uh, governments uh, and with their, when, when it came to their positions of China. But since the September 2023 election, we have a new government, which is much more uh, cordial in its approach to China. It's, again, focusing on um, topics related to um, establishment and, and uh, deepening of economic ties mm -hmm. rather than of uh, looking at this uh, relationship holistically, including security aspects, human rights aspects, political aspects, etc. Um, mm -hmm. So since I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you here, uh, Mati, for a little bit, because you've mentioned security. And on that front, uh, we actually have to expand a little more. And I want to bring Elizabeth into that discussion and fill out the uh, security gaps in this uh, mutual relation between Beijing and uh, the old continent. Uh, what are the main threats of being a partner, a trade partner to China? Is there anything in particular that we should, we should be wary of? Well, the, the most important thing is, and, and it's, it's, it's a fundamental shift, which is that China has um, weaponized globalization. It has shown that it's willing to harm companies uh, to make a political point. We have seen that with, for example, Australian winemakers that were punished by China when Australia's prime minister uh, made a politi political point, which is a call for an international inquiry into the origins of COVID. Well, China, the Chinese government could have said, uh, no, we don't like your idea and we oppose it for this and that reason. Instead, China reacted by imposing punitive tariffs on Australian wine and Australian winemakers lost 97% of their largest export markets. We have seen it with Taiwanese pineapple farmers. We have seen it with with Ericsson, uh, with fast fashion uh, retailers like H&M, and uh, we have seen it also with uh, the entirety of Lithuanian, uh, Lithuanian business, which um, happened after Lithuania invited Taiwan to open a uh, a representative office in, in Vilnius. So that's where we are today. And if you weaponize globalization, that then that means for, it, for any company operating in China or trading with China, that uh, they can never know whether it's safe to operate there. And, and that fundamentally shifts the basis on which companies uh, trade with China or operate in China. And that's why we have seen uh, political risk insurance, which covers these sorts of, of, of uh, situations everything from expropriation mm -hmm. to war, political risk insurance is barely available in China anymore because it is so risky to, to do business there. And I'm going to just quickly follow up on what you said, because you've used the term weaponization of globalization. Has that um, approach manifested by Beijing changed over the last decades, perhaps uh, even more? Or is this, has this always been a constant position that they held? No, it has it has grown dramatically from almost nothing to a situa the situation we have today, where, uh, where basically every Western company, and by the way, a number of Chinese companies as well, have to worry that they will be punished for political reasons. We have, for example, seen uh, China's uh, f f most leading and, and indeed uh, uh, best known uh, um, IT entrepreneur, I shouldn't say IT entrepreneur, businessman, Jack Ma, he has been, uh, he is an example of how China has weaponized um, uh, or, or cracks down on business for political reasons, even though he is clearly not a Western business, uh, he is a, a homegrown entrepreneur. Uh, but the first example I saw of this was in 2010, when Norway, the Norwegian Nobel uh, Committee, decided to give the Nobel Peace Prize to a Chinese dissident. And the Chinese government reacted by, uh, by suspending imports of Norwegian fish on the, on the grounds that there were susp suspicious organisms in this fish, even though there, had, there was no uh, evidence of it. So let's I'll close the economic section uh, of our debate here and move to the second part of our show when we actually try to answer the question, is China a security threat to Europe? Officially, the guiding principle of Chinese foreign policy is to not get involved in other countries' affairs. But we all know that not to be true. Chinese spies and agents of influence have been caught in several European countries and fears of Beijing weaponizing its tech platforms for intelligence gains are growing. In this next report, we'll take a look at the most contentious issues between Europe and China. In April, an unprecedented arrest rocked Germany's political scene. 
Local authorities apprehended Jian Guo, who worked as parliamentary assistant to Maximilian Kra from the AFD. He was charged with espionage and labeled a Chinese intelligence asset. Around the same time, three similar arrests were made in the UK. Particularly shocking was the case of Christopher Cash, an analyst in the office of Tory MP Alicia Kearns. Kearns also serves as the head of the British Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee. This likely gave Cash access to sensitive documents related to British foreign policy. For many, these arrests came as no surprise. European security agencies had warned for years that China was increasing its strategic involvement in European democracies. In February, Estonia's Foreign Intelligence Agency published its annual threat assessment. The report pointed to a growing risk of a Russian invasion, but pointed to China as a source of similar security concerns. Although Beijing doesn't officially contribute to Russia's military efforts in Ukraine, it hasn't condemned them either. In fact, China's direct involvement in the conflict is no longer out of the question. According to British Defense Minister Grant Chaps, China is already preparing to send lethal weapons to Russia. Fears about China are also widespread in the tech community. In May, the European Commission opened proceedings against the Chinese social media giant TikTok. The platform is accused of violating the Digital Services Act and failing to submit risk assessment documents. When it comes to security matters, the picture is very clear. Europe finds it very hard to trust China in anything. So, uh, Elizabeth, I want you to uh, briefly comment on the cases of espionage mentioned uh, in our report just now. Is this really a new intensified wave of uh, Chinese activity in Europe? Or has uh, the European continent simply become better at detecting them? Which one is it? We have become better at detecting uh, foreign espionage, both Russian, Chinese, and indeed uh, espionage by other countries. But what we have seen is Russia and China in particular um, expanding their efforts from low levels in the early 90s to extremely high levels today. Uh, and what, what they are doing is, is uh, essentially hoovering up any information they can find about our countries. So it's not just official secrets, it's any secrets they can find, and indeed any information they can find. It's not just secrets they're after. And so they essentially take this, this um, vacuum cleaner approach to, to information about our societies. They collect as much as they can, involving uh, as many people as they can, uh, as they can get involved. And uh, some of the information is extremely useful and, and in, some in, some, in some cases uh, sensitive and secret. And in some cases, it's, it's the sort of things that you could read in the newspaper, but, never, but nevertheless, they don't take any chances. They collect everything. And uh, for example, the young man you mentioned um, who uh, has been arrested uh, for, for spying on, uh, on behalf of China in the UK parliament, he's somebody that many of us interacted with. And, and he, he demonstrates, I think, the, 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 the dilemma of trying to detect this espionage because he... Um, he didn't uh, trade in, in any sort of secrets. He just worked mm -hmm. in Parliament and and uh, dealt with a academics like me, various other people. And he uh, clearly passed something along to China that then got the authorities interested. But we can't be monitoring every single parliamentary assistant and everybody who interacts with somebody who might have something of interest to mm -hmm. say. So this is the challenge we face today so with, with this sort of uh, extremely widespread espionage. How are we going to monitor it? It's, it's so extensive. And it covers so many parts of society that we can't possibly go after everybody who, who might be in some way involved. Absolutely. A vacuum cleaner approach to espionage sounds uh, a little scary. Igor, since you're a staffer of a European institution, I, I permit myself to presume that you don't have TikTok on your work a foreign. But on a more serious note, do you think that a total ban or even a limit on the operations of TikTok in the European Union countries is likely? Is it possible? And if that's the case, what would be the road leading to that? So I certainly don't have TikTok and uh, actually the European Parliament, as you know, banned TikToks on its, uh, on its devices. What is, however, frustrating that just before the European Parliamentary uh, election campaign, actually, the Parliament did uh, open, reopen its uh, TikTok account. Uh, and this is where I think we, you know, often take a one step forward and two steps back. Um, it, and I think the problem is that sometimes we don't understand the wide scale of threats that we are facing from China. That, you know, we are talking about, we need to look at TikTok or similar apps in, in a wider picture, because China is targeting our democratic institutions, but it's also targeting our societies, including through 
uh, apps like TikTok, uh, which is essentially mopping up data from from our citizens. But there is also maybe a, a, another example I would like to give, if you permit me, and that's that's the area of genomics, so the collection of DNA data. Now, uh, this may sound quite this may sound like a sci-fi thing, but for example, in Poland, there is a Chinese company BGI which is operating. Now, BGI is closely linked to the Chinese military, but it's also used for collection and analysis of DNA data from in, from our citizens. Um, in now, in what day, way, if you could uh, specify, what are the exact activities of that company? How do they collect uh, so, DNA? So there are two ways. Uh, for example, uh, the way BGI does it, it also when it when it uh, does analysis, for example, of uh, women during pregnancies or be, or just before pregnancies to to see to understand the. Um, um, how the, pre the pregnancy, but also uh, the birth of the child, uh, could could be impacted by uh, by the DNA of of the parents. So this could actually lead to two things. So you see, the Chinese have something called the international uh, in uh, intelligence law, which means that any Chinese company essentially has to provide data that it collects to the Chinese regime, should the Chinese regime wish it wish it so. So, for example. In, in this case, uh, BGI could theoretically give the, give that DNA data of our citizens to the Chinese regime, and that could be used twofold. It could be used, for example, to understand uh, the what how uh, what what it is that our citizens are, mm -hmm. for example, in terms of uh, health, how what they are vulnerable to. But even our leaders imagine that the Chinese essentially have our phones, essentially have the DNA data of our leaders, like, for example, the Polish prime minister, and what, what could be possibly done with that. Mm -hmm. uh, very important aspect in here. And uh, on that note, I actually want uh, Mathe to uh, get back into our discussion and bridge the, these two perspectives, the economic one and the security one, because days, literally days before um, us having that conversation, the European Union announced that it will impose fresh new tariffs on uh, Chinese electric vehicles, 38.1%, if I'm not mistaken. And immediately, as one could expect, Beijing threatened to retaliate with various new um, tariffs on uh, various European products coming from uh, uh, different member states. Do you think we're at risk of a trade war with China right now? I mean, certainly there is some risk of uh, this spiraling and uh, blowing out into a larger scale economic um, conflict with China. Uh, however, it has to be also uh, mentioned that uh, at this point it's EU just uh, reacting to what is going on within China, where the automotive uh, industry, especially the EV producers, have been uh, receiving quite substantial uh, subsidies from the Chinese government, which the EU believes to be contrary to the WTO. Uh, economic law, hence, hence the tariffs. Uh, also, the approach of the EU so far has been that it is not, um, you know, targeting solely Chinese companies. It is actually uh, agnostic in a way because the same tariffs will be applied also to European car makers producing in China and then exporting. Uh, to Europe because they are also benefiting from this kind of uh, subsidization. So uh, this is also um, important to, to, to note that um, this is sort of somewhat diminishing the reactions, uh, the, the credibility of the reaction coming out of China, which likes to uh, label these kind of measures as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, discriminatory in some way, uh, targeting specifically China and its uh, interests in, in uh, economic growth, etc. Uh, but, of course, this does not preclude China from uh, having a, a sort of tit-for-tat uh, reaction to this. And uh, we've seen EU, uh, sorry, China uh, already mentioning that it will be uh, targeting uh, some of the European uh, automotive uh, companies, especially those that are producing SUV vehicles and exporting those to China as a sort of luxury vehicles, mm -hmm. which has a clear, clear targeting of uh, Germany. As a as a piece in uh, China's uh, approach to to Europe, and uh, in in a way hoping that it will pressure German government into objecting to adoption of these uh, mm -hmm. countervailing duties that the EU Commission has uh, proposed. Hectic times ahead between uh, Brussels and Beijing, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Elizabeth Brau, Matej Simajic, Dr. Igor Merheim, -R. thank you very much. In the multipolar world order of today, it's hard for Europe to maintain a leading position based purely on its values. 
China's ambitions are growing and will remain significant in the decades to come. For everyone in Brussels, this poses a challenge. How do we strike a balance between the rule of law, strategic economic targets, and our security needs? Whatever the answer, it needs to be presented fast. China isn't going to wait for us to catch up. Thank you for being with us tonight. Join us next Thursday when we will examine the prospects for Ukraine's post-war reconstruction. Good night.